It's my tremendous pleasure to introduce Ryan's father and my wonderful friend, Dusty Sain. Thank you, Francis, for your very heartfelt introduction and for sharing your family story. For those of you not familiar with our story, it is simply a case of what do you do when bad things happen. For Joyce and me, when Ryan, our only child, passed away from early onset bipolar disorder at the age of 24, it was to start this foundation so that other children would not have to be Ryan and other parents would not have to be us. At first, it was just mom and dad trying to make a difference in the trajectory of an insidious illness. Now, just look around the room. The stigma of bipolar disorder is breaking with each passing day. The realization that bipolar disorder is an illness of an organ of the body, the brain, is coming into the sunlight. The realization that mental illness is not something that people can control or just snap out of, that it is a biological condition affected by a person's genetics, by their experience, and by forces that we have yet to discover. And this is the beginning of a change in community beliefs as we come to understand and know this illness. What began as two grieving parents, now, 10 years later, it's really remarkable, 10 years, has become a cause, an unstoppable cause dedicated to making the lives of people suffering with bipolar disorder better and to help their families, friends, and coworkers understand the scope and the breadth of this illness. As my wife has said over and over, people are not their illness. If someone has cancer or diabetes, they don't say, I am cancer or I am diabetes. They say, I have cancer or I have diabetes. And this is true for bipolar disorder. It is time for the perception to change. It's time for people with the illness to say, I have bipolar disorder instead of I am bipolar. Illnesses of the wiring of the brain are just that. They are not illnesses of the soul. For stigma to be finally silenced, however, everything must change, from science to medicine, from how we think about how people with disorders of the brain perceive illness and how we perceive them. It takes compassion and it takes understanding for those suffering with conditions not of their own creation. 40 years ago, breast cancer had high stigma, little science, and high mortality. Today, none of that is true. Bipolar disorder is where breast cancer was 35 years ago. When Joyce and I formed the foundation, we decided to keep its mission narrow so that the goals could be achieved. Two basic initiatives were developed to keep the foundation on track. One, to foster awareness and understanding of early onset bipolar disorder, and two, to pursue a quest for the test, to find an empirical biomarker test so that early detection and early intervention of bipolar disorder would not only be possible, but as routine as a laboratory test administered by a pediatrician's nurse. Over the years, with the help of so many who are here today, so many who knew Ryan, so many whose children grew up with Ryan. The foundation in furtherance of its first initiative has underwritten an incredible educational program developed and taught by Dr. Karen Swartz of Johns Hopkins Medical School and one of our panelists today. The program entitled ADAP, the Adolescent Depression Awareness Program, is designed to teach high school students, teachers, and their parents, well, the parents of the students, uh, about bipolar disorder, depression, suicide, and bullying, and has been sponsored by the foundation in Palm Beach County, in Chicago, and in the state of Delaware. 
There have been three annual trainings in Palm Beach County that have been conducted for more than 20 public and private high schools. Joining us today, thanks to several gen generous donors who have underwritten three professional tables, are educators and counselors from both public and private high schools from around the county and one as far away as Naples, Florida. Even though ADAP has been taught to over 40,000 students nationwide, we live in a big country and there is much ground yet to cover. The second initiative, the quest for the test, is aimed at answering the first question a parent asks the pediatrician when their child is ill. What's wrong with my child? If that child has cancer or diabetes, there are empirical biomarker tests that can determine the illness. For a mood disorder like bipolar disorder, however, there are no tests. Today, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder in children or adolescents can take up to 10 years. We want it to be 10 days. The Foundation is privileged to work with so many of the great scientific and clinical minds of our day from around the world. Today's panel alone represents some of the brightest minds in the field. Their groundbreaking work has changed the lives of so many children, adolescents, and their families, and the Foundation is very proud to have them on the Foundation's Medical Committee. But what you are doing today by participating in this luncheon is of no small order. You are helping to spread awareness and to break the stigma associated with bipolar disorder. It is your initiative that is to be applauded. And it is your support and commitment that has helped the Foundation speed on its journey. Our path is clear. Our resolve undiminished. Our quest for the test will not cease. And with you, by our side, we will not rest until millions of children, adolescents, and their families affected by bi bipolar disorder have a brighter future. Thank you. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists today and our moderator. More details about their individual backgrounds can be found in the program. David Kupfer is a giant in the field. He is the former chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, the founding president of the Worldwide International Society for Bipolar Disorders, and the chairman of the task force that wrote the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. It's the encyclopedia of all mental illness. Would Dr. Kupfer please join me and take his place on the panel? <laughs> Dr. Karen Swartz is the founder and chief of faculty for ADAP. An expert in the field of mood disorders, Dr. Swartz is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science and is the Director of Clinical and Educational Programs at the Johns Hopkins Mood Disorders Center and the Co-Director of the Women's Mood Disorder Center. Dr. Swartz is a pioneer in breaking the stigma of bipolar disorder through education and awareness. Would Dr. Swartz please come and take her seat on the panel. <laughs> Dr. Janet Wozniak is an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School and at the Massachusetts General Hospital. She authored the groundbreaking scientific paper in 1995 that proved for the first time that adolescents could have a manic episode and therefore meet the criteria for bipolar disorder. An expert clinician in child psychiatry, her research focuses on juvenile bipolar disorder. Would Dr. Wozniak please come and join us on the panel? Ms. Mary Ellen McGrath is an attorney with the Paris-based publicist group of companies. Based in Chicago, she is also the single mother of twin preteen girls, one who has bipolar disorder and one who does not. Her courage in speaking out about her personal experiences is remarkable. Mm -hmm. 
and her story will resonate with many in this audience. Would Ms. McGrath please join the panel? And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Dr. Ellen Frank. Dr. Frank is one of the true luminaries in the field. She is the director of the Depression and Manic Depression Prevention Program at the Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and is an expert in mood disorders and their treatments. She serves on the Mood Disorders Work Group of the American Psychiatric Association Task Force on the DSM-5. Do you and Ellen ever disagree on that book? Oh, absolutely. oh good, all right. Um, she was chair of the Food and Drug Administration's Psychopharmacological Drug Advisory Panel and is an honorary fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine in 1999. Dr. Kupfer and Dr. Frank are husband and wife. Would Dr. Frank please come to the lectern and then she will begin the program. For those of us who have devoted our careers to research on mood disorders, what a thrill it is to see so many of you here today. And I, I couldn't help but notice, as Dusty was telling his story, that we're not simply affecting those of you who have come to sit at the tables, but I can tell you that every single person on the staff in this room was riveted by your story, Dusty. So we're constantly affecting more people than we know. You can read the biographies of our wonderful speakers in your brochures, so I'm not going to use this time to say more about them, but give them a chance to speak to you because I know that's really why you came. David? Well, let me also um, congratulate uh, Dusty and Joyce on this wonderful inaugural event. Um, I am really very pleased, and I want to thank you all for coming. I have been given um, eight minutes to talk about a new book that's a thousand pages long that um, came out after about 10 years of work uh, this past May. Uh, so let me use my uh, eight minutes uh, as wisely as I can. The, the purpose of this diagnostic manual, and perhaps no different than the rest of medicine, but more different in a way because it deals, if you will, with mental disorders and needs to, I think, have perhaps a different language. And the purpose of this is really to communicate and provide a consistent framework for all of the disorders that are used in the mental health field. While it is published in the United States, it is used throughout the world. Now, I think to focus on where we are this afternoon, one thing that we need to first realize is that unlike the previous DSM or DSM-4, this DSM-5 has its own chapter on bipolar disorders. And this is the first time. And I think that's no small victory uh, to all of you and all of us saying this is a very important area. And while it relates certainly to the rest of mood disorders and depression, it probably does merit its own place for active discussion and change. One of the points that has already been made, and it's been made throughout this afternoon, is that it is very difficult often to make the diagnosis of bipolar disorder when people are young. Most of the time, it's wrong. Sometimes it's missed, and sometimes a different disorder diagnosis is made. Unfortunately, it still takes probably close to 10 years to get it right. I want to discuss two changes 
that have been made in the current DSM-5 that we hope will help us to make more precise diagnoses of bipolar disorder and to make them earlier. The first one, interestingly enough, is a new disorder that has to do with the fact that many times we are calling something bipolar when it's not, or vice versa. And if you're not fortunate enough to either be at John Hopkins Mass General or Pittsburgh, it may be difficult. So let me give you already the rationale for this new diagnosis, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. It has some of the characteristics of pediatric bipolar disorder, but when we do a prospective follow-up, it doesn't turn out to be bipolar disorder. And therefore, since the children who meet the criteria for this new diagnosis are more likely to go on and develop depression or anxiety disorders, or in some cases, fortunately, no continuous disorder, that we decided that it was appropriate to introduce a new disorder. And this disorder has basically several features. One of the most important set of features is severe recurrent temper outbursts in response to common stresses. Some of you may all have children or grandchildren that fit that criteria, but they don't have it <clears throat> for a year. They don't have it that frequently. It doesn't interfere with everything else going on in everybody else's lives. And that's what we mean that it's out of proportion to the provocation. And it's inconsistent with that child's developmental level. And so we're talking about greater than three times a week. We're talking about the fact that the mood between the temper outbursts is associated with an angry individual, irritable, and or sad. And this is observed by others. And so that's the first issue. The second issue, which I've already indicated, we take much too long. We should do it in 10 days rather than in 10 years. We're not there yet. So one of the things that there was considerable research and clinical literature to support was the idea that one thing that we could do would be to, in a sense, upgrade one particular symptom which relates to energy and activity. Many individuals have changes in those areas, but we've never given it the same level of importance that we give mood changes. And so consequently, what we were trying to do was in order to make the appropriate diagnosis of bipolar disorder with mania and hypomania was not just have the mood changes, but also basically use the issue of energy and changes in activity, which in many cases sometimes can be observed more easily than mood changes. And so consequently, in what we would call criterion A, which is really the first set of criteria for mania and hypomania, this is an effort to improve a retrospective examination. So when somebody comes to a clinician and you take a history, you pay as much attention to these issues as you do to just mood changes. And the studies that have come out thus far, which were in support of this diagnosis, and actually since this, has really suggested that the idea that changes in activity and energy are as central to the diagnosis of bipolar as mood changes is very important. It may also be some indication of where we should go in terms of some of our basic research efforts and biomarker research to work in this area. And so essentially, as you can see, it's abnormal and persistent increased activity or energy which has been added to it. We think that it provides increased clarity and specification and really makes it 
a core system of mania and hypomania. I could go on and discuss many other changes that have been made in the bipolar area, but I thought that these two would be of particular interest to you, interested in what we're talking about, which is early onset bipolar disorder. And so consequently, it's useful to know that mainly the other symptoms have not been changed, but these are the two changes. And at that point, the person behind me is going to say, <laughs> finito. I thank you very much. You may think this is the easy job, but it's actually the hard job. <laughs> Booting your husband and your friends off the podium is not easy. But I do know that the most important aspect of this luncheon opportunity is for you to dialogue with the panelists. So, Karen, you have eight minutes, no more. Clearly. <laughs> Well, thank you. I want to add my thanks to Dusty and Joyce and the entire committee, but also give special thanks to the Young Friends Committee chairs, Micah and Kristen, because that group has taken a particular interest in ADAP. And I'm being self-serving, I guess is what it is, but thank you. It's really important. What I'm going to talk about is what bipolar disorder looks like in an adolescent or a young adult. So think high school, college age. And I'm going to start with a really interesting survey. They did a survey of 20-year-olds, mid-20-year-olds, and asked, look back to your teenage years. Was it a time of severe emotional upheaval and turmoil? And the percent that said, yes, it was, is listed here. Any guesses as what percent of these 20-year-olds looking back said yes? So I hear 60 and 100. And the 60s are what the teachers always say when I'm doing ADAP trainings. 100 is always what the parents say. <laughs> and it's 20%. And if you look at national surveys, it's about 20% of young people that have a very serious psychiatric problem. When I think about this and how it makes sense, I think of my older sister who decided that most days would be a good day to have a fight with my mother between the ages of 13 and 16. She was lucky enough not to have a mood disorder. She just was stubborn and my mother was stubborn and I think that's why I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> but that's the 100% reaction of parents. If you ask my mother, she would say yes, definitely, even though my sister was lucky and was healthy. That's the challenge of adolescents and mood disorders. They are challenging, they are difficult, they are learning to separate from their family and become their own person, so they're already not quite who they were when they were young and more agreeable. And so you add on to that the challenge of saying, yes, but we're not talking about that, we're talking about something serious. Bipolar disorder, where there are really low periods of mood and very high periods of mood. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the symptoms of depression and mania using an example of a young man I recently took care of in the hospital. When I met him, he described that he'd had about two years where he just didn't feel right. He was more irritable, he was more likely to get in arguments with his parents, he wasn't doing as well in school, and he got very caught up in alcohol and drugs. And what he could say was, I know I felt lousy before I started, but then if I was drunk, I didn't have to feel that way. And that's what he had. He had these mood changes, but it wasn't sad. You know, we have an idea of depression that's very lifetime movie-based. Middle-aged woman, crying, sad. That is not what teenagers look like. They're irritable, they're withdrawn, they're surly. And many parents have said, that is my teenager. Irritable, withdrawn. How, what's the difference? Well, look for the other things. How about their enjoyment of activities? Are they withdrawing from activities? Has their sleep changed? Are you noticing changes in their appetite? Are their grades changing because their concentration's off? And often children keep private, unfortunately, the darkest thoughts where they doubt their own abilities and talents, they worry about their future, they think about suicide. So these are the kind of changes that happen in a depression. We've talked about delay. A recent survey showed that on average it was eight years between these symptoms starting and getting diagnosed. Because it's episodic, you go in and out of it, but a lot of chaos happens. So this young man had about two years where in retrospect, we could say, yes, you were probably depressed. But what got him to attention is when he suddenly had a change in his mood. And in that change in his mood, he was energetic. 
He was up all night. He was explaining to his teachers what they did not know. His confidence was through the roof. He broke up with a girlfriend, but was explaining to everyone why she wasn't good enough for him. Just things were very unlike him. And that went on for a couple weeks, got everyone at his boarding school quite worried, and that's what got him into care. Unfortunately, as happens so often, the depressions last for long times. The manias are often really short. So he went right out of this high mood and crashed into a low mood. But during that time, to quote him, he said, I was just a jerk. I was mean to everybody. I thought I was smarter than everyone. I was really hard to be around. And thankfully, you know, he was someone who was getting good support from his family, very good support from his school, so he got identified very quickly and is now doing well. I just had a follow-up on the phone with, with this young man and his family, but the danger is that it takes a long time to get diagnosed. So you have these very different experiences, but some of the most important are internal. So if you don't have a trained professional asking, okay, I know you were being confident, but really, how fast were your thoughts? How many were you having? Did you really think you didn't need to finish school to be able to be really successful in business? You know, did those changes really happen? It takes a conversation. And then to decide someone has bipolar disorder, you're looking for both depressive episodes, where a whole group of those symptoms come together and stay, and a manic episode. As I said, with depression, they tend to be longer. The manic episodes tend to be shorter. But it's this cycling where you're going back and forth. Dr. Wolzniak is going to talk about it's even trickier in young people, but with adolescents, they can start to describe their internal experience. But the challenge, of course, is to engage them, get them to work with someone they trust enough to talk to. Because if you can't get someone to describe what they're going through, you're just guessing. And so that's the challenge. You're looking for these. Now, it's 1% of teens that will have this, at least. That is not a small number. It's an even larger number that will have depression. Some studies say 5%, other 12%, but that's very common. And the reason I'm bringing up depression again is that in young people, when I say depressive episodes are longer, with young people, they often can last seven to nine months. So that's a whole school year. That's a whole year where you decide, I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not an honor student. Maybe I need to think about a different college or career. But the other challenge, of course, is that these are highly recurrent illnesses. So one episode is not that you're sort of over that. Your appendix is out, your appendix is out. You're not going to grow a new one. This is something that you go through this challenge, you get through it, and often the whole family says, well, thank goodness we're through that phase. But no, it's the young people that have the onset of these illnesses early that have recurrent forms, and so their illness can come back and they're dealing with new episodes. And so you really need to have a team and support to deal with that. There's a small group of people that don't do well with our, our current treatments. It's why the research that others are doing is so important, so we can understand the brain well enough to have better treatments and better ways to actually address these illnesses. But as for our theme today of early onset bipolar disorder, it's the young people, like the young man I was describing, that have the onset of depression at very young ages that are at particular risk for developing bipolar disorder. And so when people say, what do you think about treating young people with antidepressants? I say, I'm very in favor. I think it's life-saving in many cases, but you really have to monitor to make sure that it's not bipolar disorder you're dealing with. Because it's 20% of those with the onset of depression in their adolescence or younger, so younger than 18, that are at risk of going on to develop bipolar one or bipolar two. And so this is one of those highly treatable kinds of disorders that the more we know, the earlier we recognize, the better we can do for young people. Thank you. Thanks. Janet, it's up to you now. <laughs> well, um, my research and my research group has been at turns either credited or blamed with the ushering in a paradigm shift in which in child psychiatry we start to consider bipolar disorder in the differential diagnosis not only in the adolescent years but in the prepubertal years, under age 12, the earliest years of life. And when we first started to describe these children, 
Um, and I would say that our research in many ways was a triumph of the fact that we actually listened to what parents described and told us without trying to fit what they said into preconceived notions or diagnostic categories. Because at the time that we first described this group of very young children and, and published the paper in 1995, the idea that bipolar disorder could occur in children was considered so exceedingly rare, maybe you'd see one in your lifetime, not a group of 16% of your outpatient clinic. But people would ask me the question, are these the same children, uh, bipolar individuals who we see in adult clinics? And so a study like this was uh, very informative when it became available. Of uh, the in individuals in this huge uh, sample of bipolar adults, a third of them described, when you asked in a very systematic and detailed way, a third of them described that the onset of their illness occurred prior to the age of 12, another third during their adolescent years. Uh, so when you talk about an adult bipolar sample, it's a heterogeneous group of people, some of whom have this childhood onset, the kids I see grown up, some adolescent and some adult onset. And, and why it's especially important for us to think about these uh, ages of onset is we see that the earlier age of onset is associated with some of the most severe outcomes associated with bipolar disorder, suicide attempts, violence, psychosis. The child onset group is this light blue you can see has higher rates of suicide attempts, higher rates of violence, and higher um, or similar rates of psychotic features. Um, in particular, suicide and violence, terrible outcomes um, um, in, uh, in bipolar disorder, um, th really the worst possible thing and what we're mitigating against in trying to identify early and treat early. Um, and then I will even go as far to say as um, th these individuals, it's not just between the ages of 5 and 12 or 8 or 10, you might say, well, well an 11 or 12-year-old is almost like an adolescent. But when you ask parents about the ages of onset of the disorders, these are children who don't have a pre-existing identity of doing well and then suddenly having a change in personality. They have diagnosable di disorders from the earliest ages of life, the preschool ages. And so this slide il illustrates on one of our samples the average age of onset for some of these childhood disorders. This is when we were looking at our under age 12 onset kids. So of the children who I see in the clinic who are under age 12, 75% of them, um, in 75% of the cases, parents describe an onset prior to the age of five, the preschool age. By the time they get to us, they're age 8 to 10, for more than half their life, they've been living with an emotionally dysregulated um, cycling uh, mood disorder. And so th this slide illustrates a little <coughs> bit uh, what one parent described to me in terms of how their child presents. Um, because the, as you already heard from Karen and from David too in terms of the diagnostic criteria, bipolar disorder is characterized by fluctuating intense, severe emotional dysregulation states. And one of the um, parents actually gave me this image of his daughter as a five-pointed star. And he said, what I see in my daughter are these different states of her emotion that kind of she fluctuates in and out of, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, sometimes more on one point and less on the other. But I'll go through. One part of this is just not always an easy going, but typical of the developmental age. Like, um, a regular kid that will sometimes be a parent, and sometimes maybe you might see if you have a friend with a bipolar child, that's the face that the child will put on when you're visiting or when you see them. Um, then there's the two you know, most classic forms of bipolar disorder, the euphoric side, giddy, goofy, silly, hyper high, some of the energy surges, the excessive confidence, the overestimating one's ability to do things, and then melancholy, sad, blue, hopeless, uh, down on oneself, negative self-thoughts, self-esteem self problems, even suicidal thoughts. The other more complicated points of this star have to do with the irritability. And um, that one of the reasons we have a new disorder in the DSM that David described, the Di um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder has to do with c this recognition that irritability is a major part of these mood disorders. It's an indication that you should think of bipolar disorder in the differential, but not all of the children belong there if they don't have the other features. Um, but irritability has these two different parts to it. There's a lower level, angry, grouchy, cranky, whiny, complainy, difficult to please, short-tempered, and then there's the irritability that we tend to think of as manic level irritability, which is severe, dangerous, um, out of control, wild. It can be punctuated by explosions with, can be destructive, aggressive, really frightening to witness or be part of. And yet, 
um, so many of the families I see on a daily basis are living with this hospitalization level severity of rage and irritability. So the bipolar disorder that we see in kids often presents with a complicated what we call mixed state. Elements of the depression and the mania are present simultaneously. So we'll see a child who's um, fluctuating between um, symptoms of mania and depression even within one day or within one week. So it's not such a clear picture where we can parse out a week full of just euphoria or a week full of just melancholy or a week full of just irritability. You might have that, but more often than not, the children have this very complicated, mood dysregulated, mixed state. Um, so uh, I'll give you a, just an example, a, a sort of a um, fictionalized account of a very typical type case for me. Um, so I describe a girl, a 10-year-old, Laura, I give her that name, cranky, miserable all day, refuses her mother's uh, suggestions for fun activities, joyless, unhappy, let's play, let's do, no, I don't like it, it's no fun, I don't want to. That's the way childhood depression will often present. Um, but then she gets a phone call, and all of a sudden, she changes. She's talking a mile a minute. She's got super excitement. There's going to be a party at school. She needs new dresses. She needs five new dresses. She needs to prepare now, even though it's a week away. Why doesn't her mother help her now, 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 now? It has to happen. Her popularity is exaggerated. How attractive she'll be to all the boys, all the boyfriends she'll have, talking and can't stop. All of a sudden, it turns into a moment where she demands that her mother get her a new cell phone. And it has to happen now because she has to text her friends, and it has to happen immediately. And then there's an explosion. 60 minutes, screaming, yelling, hitting, kicking, thrashing, uh, spitting, biting, throwing, breaking. I get a phone call and I can hear it in the background, the crashing and all of the kind of rage that's occurring and going on. Um, and I say, well, what in the world could this have been in response to? She wants a new cell phone and I said we couldn't get it. And mother will, sometimes a mother will say, I've even said we'll go next week. But it's not enough, the rage has happened. Then as the evening progresses, we see the melancholy, sobbing, sad, uh, I caused you so much trouble. Mom, you must hate me. How can you love a kid like me? Why don't you just kill me? Why don't you and Dad just get rid of me? How could you possibly want me in this family? Heartbreaking depression. This is the kind of roller coaster of moods that we see in these kids. And, uh, and sadly, I wish I could tell you this was an unusual occurrence, but I think I could fill this room plus the rest of it with uh, stories and families I've met, um, the children who are suffering with this on a daily basis. Thank you, Janet. So, uh, Mary Ellen McGrath has unfortunately lived this uh, story for many years now, and she's got the courage to talk to us about it. So, please, Mary Ellen. Okay. Joyce asked me six months ago if I would speak today and tell you what it's like to be the parent of a child with bipolar disorder. I gave this speech last May at the Foundation Luncheon in Chicago. Not a lot has changed since then, so my apologies go out to those in the audience who have already had to sit through this once. Actually, that's not entirely true. Two small milestones have occurred in my family since the last time I spoke publicly about this. My daughter started seventh grade, and I ran my first Chicago Marathon. Oh, no, no, no. It was my, also my last Chicago Marathon. <laughs> but I will tell you that the painstaking experience of training and running that race, training for and running that race, was a piece of cake compared to seventh grade and to the daily challenges that my family faces and I know so many of your families face because of this insidious illness. My daughter is 12 and a half years old. She's blonde and beautiful. She's sweet. She loves theater and music and the color pink. She dreams of being a movie star and she longs to be popular. She was diagnosed at seven with early onset bipolar disorder. She's also a twin, not identical. Her sister is not only typical, she's exceptional. A gifted student and athlete, well-liked by her peers, an easy and all-around great kid. 
She is alternatively embarrassed and angered by her sister, yet she's fiercely protective of and endlessly worried about her twin at the same time. My girls are also children of divorce. Their father and I separated when they were five, two years before the diagnosis. Our divorce has not been amicable. This has been hard on both girls, particularly on my sweet girl who struggles with bipolar disorder. Her issues presented when she was not quite two years old. My sister, who is a social worker, identified some developmental delay, and this led to some basic therapy that addressed her speech and motor issues. Her increasingly volatile moods, however, remained a growing source of frustration and difficulty for our entire family. By the time she was in kindergarten, she would have periodic meltdowns, which over time became more frequent and more intense. It became harder and harder to calm her down after extended periods of time, often over an hour. This was in stark contrast to her sister, who would get upset over things but then eventually self-soothe or was able to be calmed without extraordinary time and effort. We went for a psychological evaluation and we were referred to our wonderful psychiatrist who diagnosed her by saying, not only is she bipolar, she's really bipolar. I remember feeling like I had been hit by a freight train. Bipolar was such a terrifying word to me and I was in such a state of shock that it was being applied to my sweet girl. But I knew she needed help and so she started on medication immediately. And miraculously, she got better. Her mood stabilized, she had periods of contentment, and life in our house became calmer. But as my 80-year-old mother says, and many of us know to be true, everything is always changing, and my sweet girl is no exception. After a while, the original medication which had rescued our family eventually started to lose its effectiveness. So we had to add meds and play with dosages. I started a notebook to keep track of it all. As she grows and her body changes, her treatment has become as much art as it is science. And always, and for the foreseeable future, there is lots and lots of therapy. This is all frustrating and exhausting for all of us. Most of all, of course, for her. as She just longs to be like every other seventh grader. So most days we walk on eggshells, knowing that whether it's a good day or a bad one, depends largely on her mood. The smallest thing can send her into orbit. A lost earring, an app that doesn't work on her iPad, or her sister chewing cereal too loudly. We, the family members, are required to be superhuman in our patience and tolerance. We are the family that you see <laughs> hurriedly rushing out of church or a restaurant or any number of public places because my daughter has hit the wall and is uncontrollable. The next time you see this family or this episode, please don't assume it's a bratty, spoiled kid. My heart breaks on a regular basis as the world is not an easy place for her to navigate. School, friends, emotions, simple tasks, all of these are hard for her. It's also hard on her twin who just wants a sister who's normal. Speaking of which, bipolar disorder presents unique challenges for parents and siblings. Because the bipolar child's needs are so great, he or she necessarily demands and consumes a disproportionate amount of the parental attention. This leaves other siblings feeling neglected, resentful, and unhappy. Siblings may act out to gain attention, withdraw, or even worse, become depressed themselves. The parents, already exhausted from dealing with the bipolar child, are often running on empty, with little left for the other family members. I'm a single mom, so I put out the fires with the one, and then try and muster up as much strength as I can for her twin. Some days I do better than others. I usually end up tucking the twin in at night and talking about what was difficult that day. I try to make sure she feels heard, and I try to validate what she's feeling. 
She often asks when her sister will be better or cured. These conversations make my heart ache, both for her and for her sister. I have many worries. I worry about my sweet girl surviving middle school, which is no easy place, and then high school, and how puberty will affect her condition. I worry about whether she will go away to college, live independently, fall in love, and make friends who will be patient and understanding with her. Her family has to love and tolerate her outbursts, but other people don't and won't. I worry about her twin and her emotional state, as she so often has to suck it up and be the good, responsible child. I worry about not losing it myself, as both girls seem to save the drama for their mama on a daily basis. But in the end, I actually get a ton of inspiration from my sweet girl, who has so many challenges, and yet faces most days with a smile, a positive attitude, and a killer pink outfit. I'm also deeply inspired by her twin, who has developed incredible resilience, strength, and compassion because of our family experience. I don't know what the future holds, and I don't have any answers on the key to coping as a parent in this very challenging situation. I lean on a lot of people, all of whom I'm grateful for, and I take it a day at a time. I think that's all any of us can do. I am so inspired by and grateful to Joyce and Dusty, to the work of the foundation, and to the dedicated doctors sitting right here, all of whom are try trying tirelessly to help families like mine and yours. Thanks for allowing me to share my story with you today. We are all connected here. So I know that some of you may have appointments or commitments and need to leave. So we just ask that if you do, please do so quietly, but the doctors will stay and answer your questions for probably the next 15 minutes. So um, are there people in the audience who would like to address a question to you? Yes. I think we've got microphones circulating, but I'll repeat the, okay, and I'll repeat your question. Resource, resources in different areas, what, what would you do? Would you go to your local hospital, mental health, head of the psychiatric ward? What would you do as a mother? I have two in the 20s, in their 20s, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure there's people in Palm Beach County. Is it sectioned off? Is it organized? Is there organization that would basically yeah. lead a person like myself or someone younger to the right place? Uh, so I could answer some. Yeah. The, the um, I mean, certainly if you're near a major medical center, um, it, it, there's a psychiatry department, and you could go there to um, look for an appointment or for expertise. But um, now that we have the web, the um, DBSA, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, is a wonderful resource. And within that, you can also find the um, uh, child and adolescent um, s subgroup. Um, and it involves sometimes different um, question and answers, educational material, and um, just to speak to your point, it can also, um, you can also find resource lists um, of places where you might go for uh, evaluation. Some individuals who live in underserved areas, and sometimes I count New York City in that category, <laughs> and you know, maybe Florida could too, might go to a large research uh, group, could go to Pittsburgh, could go to Hopkins, could go to Harvard for an evaluation and um, suggestions, and then try and bring them back home for implementation. Karen, is there anything you want to add to that? No, other than also realizing that if you call a major medical center, there may be graduates that have gone out into the community. So I get a lot of those calls, and we know where, you know, people haven't stayed in Baltimore, but they've gone to North Carolina, they've gone to Florida, and so that's often a resource too. 
There's also a group of mood disorder centers, that's now the National Network of Depression Centers, and around the country, because I know many people are in Florida for just part of the year. That's another web resource just to identify major centers where they're focusing on mood disorders. The web address for the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance is www.dbsalliance.org for any of you who are looking for it. Another question or comment? Yes. girls have anything to do or have tests been done to see if the early puberty comes because of the bipolar or does bipolar come as a result of that or is there no connection at all? Very, very good question. Janet, do you want to try to field that? Yeah, so to my knowledge, early onset puberty and bipolar disorder, the two, it hasn't been explored and there hasn't been a particular connection between the two, but it's commonly uh, known in child and adolescent psychiatry that early puberty, especially for girls, uh, produces a particular emotional and psychological stress. And so you could imagine that in somebody who is otherwise predisposed, it could then um, trigger depression or bipolar disorder, anxiety, or a whole variety of different reactions. What do you define so I don't know why it only just occurred to me today, since I've been in this field for a really long time. But listening to the panel today, it occurred to me that not only is the treatment of bipolar disorder in adults an enormous challenge and sometimes more art than science, but in the developing child, you're working with this moving target. Uh, so all the things we can count on in adults to stay the same while we're trying to treat the condition are constantly changing in the developing child. David, you well, look I, like you want I was just gonna amplify that, which is to say that you're dealing with a very a moving rapid target. developmental period and early onset of puberty for girls just is one more, it's, as far as what we know now, it's not necessarily hormonal or endocrine changes per se, but just another stress in this rapid developmental mm -hmm. period where there is very, very little stability. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any advances in the medication field for bipolar disorder? Karen, you're smiling. Sure. So. I, I wish there were more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think with someone was asking me at lunch about all the new treatments with magnetic mm -hmm. stimulation, et cetera. The great thing is, I think many people are working tirelessly to, to try to identify them. And we get new options. And it usually takes us a little while, I think, to know how to best use them. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes old things like lithium are still very important. But there are some of the new anticonvulsant medicines like Lamictal, Trileptal, others that I think we will learn how to best use them. So I'd say the most hopeful thing is a lot of people that are very smart are devoting their lives to get more options. We need more and better options than we have now. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, and I think one of the things we've seen is that it really is the rare individual for whom one medication is sufficient. So it's not simply are, is there a new medication, but are we learning to use what we have um, in different combinations and in different ways that may well, be helpful? I, I think one feeling about feeling good about progress is this may not help most of us in Palm Beach County, but there's an article this week or last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's a study that was carried out in Taiwan, which clearly is showing that those people who are responsive in a sample well over north thousand individuals, that 50% of the people of responsiveness to lithium had a specific genetic makeup, which is not so difficult to look at. And the first thing that I read when I looked at it and said to you, I said, my God, if we can do this profile early on, think of where we are in terms of prevention and early intervention. And that's just one of the maybe 100 things that mm -hmm. I think are going on. And uh, I'm normally a cheerful pessimist, so I'll be a <laughs> careful optimist and say that, you know, in a few years, uh, maybe it will be the third or fourth luncheon that you will have here, and you'll be dealing with the entire room. And there may be some strong announcements at that point mm -hmm. of 
major progress. Mm -hmm. So I think when Dusty and Joyce talk about the quest for the test, they've always spoken about a test that a pediatrician's nurse could use to determine whether or not someone has bipolar disorder. But equally important would be to be able to determine before you start treating a child who's been identified as having bipolar disorder, this is a child who's going to be responsive to lithium. This is a child who's clearly not going to be. And that would be an enormous step forward. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Coming from the school setting, I'm wondering. Thanks. Coming from the school setting, as I am, I'm wondering about uh, gender differences in early onset bipolar. Mm -hmm. That is to say, is it more prevalent? Is the incidence higher in males versus females? or not, uh, and also are the, um, are the demonstrated behaviors gender sp specific? Are we looking for different things in girls? Do we see different things in girls than we do in boys? Mm -hmm. uh, Janet. Well, I, we just published a paper looking at gender differences um, probably in the past year, year and a half, and um, what we the conclusion was there are more similarities than differences between the boys and girls, although there were some interesting notable differences. Um, um, and I will uh, preface this by saying that, you know, I spend a lot of time in my practice working with bad boys, more bad boys than bad girls. I mean, I, you know, this is what people call them, right? And um, the uh, behaviors are often uh, come across as rude, insulting, bratty, ill-behaved. Um, so um, why there's more boys than girls in these clinic and research settings is not entirely clear and where there may be a systematic bias as to who comes to treatment. So we don't, we don't know what to say about that male preponderance. But once we then look at the girls and boys under our care, they present more similarly than different. The uh, girls, one of the things that we were looking at in uh, speaking to the early puberty was hypersexuality. And it seemed as if the endorsed symptom of hypersexuality occurred somewhat greater frequency in girls. And you could um, imagine the difficulties that that might um, uh, wreak for that particular girl and the, and the family in terms of her sense of self and her identity. Uh. Yeah. Other comments, questions, all the way in the back. Hi there. Also in the realm of education, what do you do when you're in a situation where you're not the parent, you're the teacher, so you're not in a place where you can say, this is a problem, we need to get a diagnosis. What's the best way to respond to a child in that situation? Karen. Well, I would, every school has a group of point people. It's often the counselors and the people in that role, and they have a lot of experience of making those very challenging phone calls to parents. I think that if we have everyone in a young person's life sharing information, you want to share it with someone that's then prepared to do something. And so when we educate through it at whole school populations, I'll say to the math teachers and the science teachers, we're not asking you to intervene, but just share information with the counseling department. And then they have a lot of expertise in getting in touch with the parents and facilitating an evaluation and having the next right thing happen. Sounds like a good strategy. Yes. Anyone else? No. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing where you are. I'm right back. Okay. Um, okay <laughs> please. Um, I'm interested in knowing if there is a particular recommended medication protocol or if you would suspend the medication protocol for adolescents who are on medication, but then you find out that they are also smoking pot, drinking, and using other recreational drugs. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> Jump right Tough in. Case. Yeah. Yeah, difficult cases. So, well, um, maybe I'll just speak to the substance abuse part uh, first. Um, when somebody presents with a what we call dual diagnosis, the dual being substance abuse addiction and a serious psychiatric disorder, or quite frequently bipolar disorder, because it, bipolar disorder poses a huge risk for substance abuse and addiction. Right. We, we know that. Um, we, I think of it as a, like a Chinese checkers game. You don't move one checker across the board at a time. You're doing both, all of them, right, at the same time. You have a number of agendas simultaneously. But it's very, very critical to um, s um, encourage and somehow enforce abstinence because even marijuana, which people often take a casual eye to, it's fun, it's safe, it's no big deal, can, the, marijuana can produce a clinical picture that looks like psychosis, bipolar disorder, depression, suicidality. So before you pile on a whole bunch of medications to treat that, it's important to get the toxin away, 
right? Um, saying that, uh, the symptoms are often so severe that we will simultaneously do both. We'll encourage abstinence by treating the symptoms of depression and anxiety, which might be fueling the substance abuse and addiction. It becomes a much more complicated treatment plan, but that's the way to do it. And I think there's a growing reality that the use of marijuana re really increased the risk of psychosis, and particularly those people who are vulnerable to bipolar disorder. This may be a, a bad recipe. At this point, we're going to conclude the formal uh, part of this lunch.